Welcome to our class tonight. We are considering at this time in these sessions uh, what I am calling now the persistence of God in the midst of his people. God's persistence here that is described in Numbers chapter 16, 17, and 18. Because here we see God further, continually and further clarifying his understanding of Israel. His relation to Israel. His knowing with regard to all of the congregation of Israel. And it's very significant, I think, to understand that this is what God is doing. We have to understand God is not dealing with a bunch of heathen here. He's dealing with his people. He's dealing with his house. He's dealing with his church. He's dealing with Israel. So we have to understand that what God is doing here is not destroying heathen. He is judging within his own house. He is, we could say it this way, he is making known the judgment of his mind and his knowing and his grace in the midst of his people. And thank God that he is continually persistent with us in doing the same because it is necessary the seeing of Christ the knowing of Christ the growing up in the the, the head and all things that is not that is not something that can that can be accomplished in a one time glancing of Jesus Christ that has to continually take place because everywhere His face is not governing, mine is. Every place his name is not being declared, mine is. And we'll see that in a moment because basically what we're going to do is look at the last class and and reiterate and reemphasize the things that we said in the last class because I think the presentation may not be very good, but this this is a beautiful picture of what God is persistent in doing in the hearts of all of us who are in his son. He is persistent and desiring persistently and and continually to make known his knowing in the midst of Israel. Now, um, when we... I think a couple of classes ago we we talked about how all of this really begins. And I think it begins because we were looking at this as a relationship, a, a relationship that is the relationship of grace, the relationship that is governed by the cross. And that's what God brought them to. I mean, the whole creation, the, the, the exodus itself was all a work of the cross, the blood, the blood of the lamb, the door. So in Exodus 24, we see this again beautifully typified, a picture of it, where I'll I'll read the verses I have here, uh, Exodus 24, 5 through 8. And he, Moses, sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings, sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. He then took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. Now listen, again, let me emphasize the order of this. He had the blood, he splits the blood. This is one blood, not two different types of blood, but one blood that he splits, puts one portion of the blood upon the altar, And now, after that, he reads the book of the covenant, or the law, to them. And he reads it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All the Lord has spoken, we will do it. Now, God knew that that was an impossibility for them to do all that they had just heard. That is why 
the blood was first sprinkled upon the altar before the reading took place. He had already taken care of the situation as far as the doing of what was written in the book of the law or the book of the covenant. And remember, it's the book of the covenant. He had already, he had already foreseen the inability to do or to obey because it, it also says we, are, we will do it and we will be obedient. What does it mean to do it? And what does it mean to be obedient? How is that possible? Christianity today emphasizes the means by which we can do and be obedient to God to do the works and do what God wants and do what God demands. How is that possible? Well, God understood it was not possible for man. In fact, the whole book of the covenant was an indictment upon man and declaring to that man, you're not the seed with whom the covenant is made. It exposed him as who he was, but God understood. God had already covered that in first sprinkling the blood on the altar. But now after they say, we'll be obedient and we'll do everything that he says to do, here's what happens. Moses took the blood, that same blood that he had put on the altar. Now the other portion of that blood, he sprinkles it on the people. One says he splattered it all over the people, one translation says. Now, there is some debate, and it really doesn't matter whether he did it on all of them, because a lot of people to sprinkle in that little bit of blood. What most people believe are the 12 pillars that he set up representing Israel. He sprinkled it on top of the 12 pillars. Regardless, he sprinkled the blood that had touched the altar. Now he sprinkled it on those people. Remember, this was... In, in relation to them saying we will do and we will be obedient. What does this mean? God knows that for the covenant to be kept, these people must be identified with the altar. They have to be identified with the blood that is on the altar. It's called the blood of the covenant. To do what the book of the covenant says, you must be identified with with the blood of that covenant. In other words, God, God is bringing them into a relationship that says this, to do what I desire to be done, to do and to be obedient to this command, to this covenant, to this law, to keep it to any degree. The thing that must govern you, the thing that you must be acquainted with is the reality of the altar, which is not I, but Christ. We do not live. There is only one who lives. And we're going to see that that is the emphasis and that is the thing that God is persistently making known in the midst of his people here in Numbers. He's already done it in, 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 uh, with, the, with the rebellion of Korah and his company. And I don't, I'm not going to go into that again, but there's so many commentaries that I've read, Josephus and different ones that say that after the, uh, they were swallowed up by the earth, and also you have some that were burned with fire and then Korah was swallowed up in the earth and then those that were burned with fire, but you... And, you know, you can go into a lot of different symbolisms with that, that there is God is a consuming fire and that, you know, he consumes all things and all things that can be shaken, all things that can be removed will be removed, that there will be a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Well, that kingdom is, is, is personified in that one seed, in that one son who remains, that one Aaron who remains and was untouched and chosen of God made known in the midst of the people that there was one chosen one holy it's not a bunch of people being holy it's the one holy one in the midst that determines the whole thing their nearness to God now determined by one seed whose right it is to be drawn near unto God and you read all that in chapter 16 and then the next thing, of course, 
He becomes the dividing line between the living and the dead of those who murmured again after, after the, the uh, destruction of Corin and this company. But what I want to talk about tonight is chapter 17 and something in chapter 18. But let me, let me go back just a second. When we talk about the blood of the covenant and the sprinkling of the blood on the people, it brings us back to the cutting of the covenant with Abraham or with Abram at that time. Remember the vision. We've talked about it in, in real early classes and this being the basis of God's dealing with Israel. This covenant cut between the father and the son. You see the Abraham has this vision. He's talking about a seed and uh, the God, God has not given him a seed and God tells him all of the things that will happen to the seed, Israel, what will take place. And he's referring to them. And, and, and he also, at the end of this, says they will, at the end of that 400 years of slavery, they will come out. I think it may be up out of with abundance, great abundance and great possessions. And then he goes into a trance or a dream or whatever. And Abram, Abram's on this over here somewhere. And he sees this going on. And the thing that really struck me in that picture was that Abram is not an active participant in the cutting of the covenant. He's just beholding it and seeing it. God himself is the only active participant in the cutting of the covenant. The, the surety of the covenant relies on God and God alone. That's it. It doesn't rely on Abram. Abram is later, after he sees it, brought into a covenant that's already cut, already ratified and established. And you see the vision where the two objects, the, the pot, the burning pot or the oven, whatever, and, and then this torch, and I see it as the father and the son, coming together through the pieces of the sacrifices, cutting a covenant, confirming a covenant. God confirming the covenant with his seed. This is the covenant to which he is faithful. And as I was thinking about that with, with this blood sprinkled on the people, it's the same thing. It's the, all of the sacrifice start right there. In relation to the Israel, in relation to the seed... The coming in of the law did not abrogate those sacrifices. Those sacrifices are brought into the law. The cutting of those animals brought right into the law. Why? Because it did not nullify this covenant made with the seed. It just kept the promises and the inheritance for the seed until the seed came. And Paul says that in Galatians. But when we look at the covenant, I was reading some things uh, concerning it. And uh, I found this article that was written by a professor, a uh, Jewish professor, and uh, I'm trying to find his name, Joel Litke. And he writes this article in the Jewish Bible Quarterly. And there was a part here that I want to emphasize because I think it's very important. He says, what seems, however, a more relevant and persuasive explanation is the Torah's need to convey an important message, though it is unstated and implied. In spite of Israel's frequent and almost unforgivable acts of disloyalty and rebelliousness, the covenant between God and Israel was never affected. It endured and it remained in force. Nowhere is there even a hint that God has rejected or abandoned the nation. Now I know where he's going. But listen where I'm going with this. Though the people often provoked his anger and were punished for it, the deed and the terms of the covenant remained valid. 
telling the story of Israel's many failings in the Torah is the Torah's way of demonstrating the irrevocability of God's covenant. The people may be punished, exiled, and rebuked, but God's commitment is constant and inviolate. It cannot, it will never be violated, it never be stopped, abrogated, or, or, or cease. Now, again, I know where he goes with this, and I know where he will go with this, of course, but I want you to understand something about what we're seeing here, and every time it is, there is all of these failings of Israel, and you're thinking, God, why is he, de- why is he still dealing with these people? Because the people are not the object of his view. The people are not the measure of the covenant. Understand this. Yes, I believe I believe that's probably true. The many different ways that we see their failings and all of the things that happen, yet God remains faithful to his covenant. Why? That's why he continually, uh, they, they bring up, God, remember your covenant. And the word remember there is to keep ever before your face. Keep ever before your face this covenant. Why? Because it keeps me out of the picture. If, if he were to look at me, the covenant would, would, would be broken. The covenant would cease to be. But he beholds the object and the ratifying object of the covenant. The only party of the covenant. And that is the one to whom he is forever faithful. You see what I'm saying? He's not faithful to the people. He's faithful to the one in view of whom those people exist. Same today. He's not faithful to us. We are not the measure of God's covenant. We are not the reason he keeps a covenant or the reason he's happy with us or sad with us. We think that. We think God has changed, changes from day to day and his attitude toward us changes. No, he has a covenant. It's not now a covenant in testimony. It is a, it's the real true reality of the covenant because the seed with whom the covenant was cut is in you, is in you. And it is that one to whom he is faithful. He is faithful who has called us unto the fellowship of his son. That is, it's that son to whom he is faithful. That son with whom his covenant is made is the object of his faithfulness. That, see this, This is not lauding or excusing failure. The many pointing out of of Israel's failure. It wasn't to say, okay, well, you know, they're just being who they are. That's not, that's not, it's not about excusing failures. It's truly placing the weight of our relationship with God upon its only proper foundation. And that is Christ in you. The validity or the continuance of the covenant was never contingent upon many people keeping the ordinances of the law. There were punishments for not keeping it, but it was always and only contingent upon the one in view of whom the law was given. The law was a testimony of one son. One life. But it could not, Paul says, give the life of which it spoke. It was a testimony of one life that would come, one son that would come. That is why God clothed them, I'm going back to a lot of earlier classes, clothed them with a testimony of his son clothed them in Christ in a testimonial way. And you go to the, to the intricate details and nature of that law. Why? Because it is a testimony of a perfect 
life. A perfect son, the perfect one. Under that testimony we see one law, one covenant operating and having its effect in the midst. In Christ, we now have the one life living in us. Fully supplying unto us all spiritual substance. Being in us the full supply of all spiritual things. So it is this commitment in the light of a covenant that's being addressed in the midst of Israel. God is making known the sure and perfect reality of the covenant because he's revealing the singleness of it, the simplicity of it, and the surety of it in that one. I wrote here, God is demonstrating the sureness of the covenant in that it is made with one, ratified in one, and sure unto one. And people say, well, what about me? That one is your life. And that's what they're going to see here in chapter 17. That's what they see. That's what God makes known in them. It's the judgment, but it's the judgment of truth. It's the judgment of grace that comes into the house of God. So that they may live in the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. Not their knowing of, but his knowing being made known and manifest in their midst. Why do we still seek a righteousness of our own? Why do we attempt to be the fulfilling of God's demands? It's very simple. We have never seen the one in us who is our life unto God. And everywhere that desire is still there for me to have my place or me to have my stand before the Father, the need is the seeing of the one. It's not stop doing that. You can't. Stop trying to take his place. You can't. It's called the lust of the flesh. That's all you've got. (laughs) Flesh is flesh. That's all you have. What you do have is a life that has been given unto your soul that you're ignorant of. A life that God would make known. A perfect life. A perfect righteousness. But that perfect life and that perfect righteousness is not you. Nor does it have your face in it. Nor does it have your name on it. It has no... You are not the evidence of it. And you are not the measure of it. perfect and eternal delight the amen of God that's the need to see him so again we're talking about we're going to go to chapter 17 here and talk about the a further clarifying a further clarification I've I've kind of titled this uh, Israel Simplified because it is exactly what's taking place. God is simplifying their relationship with himself. See, that, I'm not making light of it when I say simplified. what What I'm saying is God is bringing about in their midst his understanding of what it means to have a relationship with him. His understanding of relationship. His understanding of covenant. His understanding of, of who Israel truly is. God is making known in their midst. So we're going to see this. God simplifying. 
in their view, their relation with himself. And that has to happen in us. And we'll get to that in a moment. But again, this is just God further in his persistence making his mind known in the midst of his people. So in verse 1 of chapter 17, let's, let's start reading there. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take a, of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, and all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And they shall lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. Now, notice something very significant here. And this is going to bear out at the end of this story. And it's going to be tremendously important. And it's something that that we have to, I think, it's very significant. Let me just say it that way. The rods that are taken, first they're taken from the princes of the tribes. Now, remember back when, when we were talking about Korah and the company that were uh, gathered against Moses and Aaron. It caused them men of renown, men of great esteem. Princes. The upper echelon, I guess you could say. We're talking about the heads of the people. Well, we're talking about the same thing here. These are princes, the leaders of the tribes, the heads of the tribes. And he says, take every man according to the heads of the tribe, bring a rod. And I think this was their rods. Bring their rods to me. But he did, doesn't just do that. It's significant that he has Moses write their names on it. They don't just bring a stick. They write their name on it. Identifying with it. Probably saying, I pos- this is my, I possess this. This is, I identify with it. Just as they laid their hand on a, on a sacrifice to identify with it. They put their name on this. And then Aaron puts his name on the rod of Levi. And then God says, put it before, in the tent of meeting before the testimony. And see, this is significant as well. Remember when he says the tent of meeting before the, the before the, uh, the testimony, he's talking about the Holy of Holies. Remember what we have uh, looked at in previous classes. You have the encampment of Israel. Remember the, the encampment of Israel and you have, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to draw it, but you have the the four sides, the encampment, and we know that the encampment was in the shape of a cross when you look at it from 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 above and all of that. But but we were looking more specifically in these classes with the encampment, and we were emphasizing each encampment had their own ensign. Remember, we were looking at the ensign and how each ensign had a symbol that that uh, determined that tribe or that. That was the symbol and the the uh, it named basically named that tribe. And remember how we said that each one of those ensigns, each one of those banners, corresponded to the breastplate, to one stone on the breastplate of the high priest. Basically bringing the whole of the encampment into one man. God summing up the whole of the encampment, the whole of the congregation. The congregation means the ones gathered. Again, going back to classes previous, because it's all coming together here. 
Remember uh, Jesus saying over Israel, how long I would have gathered you. How long I would have gathered you unto myself, but you would not. You desired me not. Therefore, your house is left desolate. The word desolate means it is left without the proper and rightful occupant. And then, after he says that, he departs from the temple in Matthew 24. Why? They, in testimony, God had gathered them in one. The one ensign. The one true standard. The one gathering place. The one we see in Revelation. In the midst of his church that says, I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the living one. We're going to see that manifestly seen here in chapter 17. I am the living one. See this? One man. Summing up the whole of the congregation. Now we talked about that, and that was in with his with his garments. But on the day of atonement, he would stand here in the Holy of Holies, not clothed with the representative garments of Israel. He did not stand there in this day representing Israel. He stood there as Israel, clothed with pure white linen, speaking of his own intrinsic righteousness and perfection and purity. He stands there as the one seen and known of God, the one accepted of God. We're going to see this again right here. It's very significant. Their names, now Moses is said, commands, bring all of these rods and put them before the, basically bring them into the Holy of Holies before the Ark of the Testimony. Where I meet with you. Because what we're about to see is what they cannot see or know or understand unless God reveals it. We're about to see God's eternal perspective. God's understanding, a heavenly view, a heavenly knowledge, a heavenly understanding with regard to all Israel. And it's going to bring a judgment in the midst of Israel when it is revealed. This is very important because it's the same picture as the Day of Atonement when He comes out and shows Himself as the one upon whose breast the whole of Israel resides and abides. Living, the one living one. Showing himself to the house of Israel. As their salvation, as their life, as their atonement. And in the appearing of that one, he becomes a judgment in their midst. We have nothing unto God except who he is. We have no righteousness before God except who he is. Because now he appears as the unveiled view of God. The unveiled knowledge of God has appeared. And they see a judgment. And, they, and there's a reckoning in the midst of the house of Israel. In the midst of the congregation. You see the same picture here. He brings all the rods into the Holy of Holies. Now let me, let me read... Let me read these these verses here. Now before he does this, God further speaking to to Moses says in verse 5, And it shall come to pass 
the man's rod whom I shall choose. The Young's literal, I love the Young's literal of this. It says, the man's rod on whom I'm fixed. His gaze, his sight is fixed upon one. And the one upon whom he's fixed shall flourish, shall bloom, and blossom. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Listen to the order here. God says, the one upon whom I am fixed, the word there, uh, let me... The word fixed here is, is basically choose, and it means to select, to appoint, to choose, to be excellent, to be acceptable. The one upon whom I fix, my gaze is fixed, shall flourish. And in that flourishing, I will make to cease from me their complaints, their murmuring. You see that? The only thing that ceases the murmurings of the natural mind against the supremacy and the sufficiency of this one is seeing this one. To see the one who flourishes, the one who, <laughs> who bears fruit unto the Father, the one who is awakened and risen, because we're going to get into all of that, but it's the one, it's seeing him that ends all debate and all murmuring and every question and every concern and everything that in the human heart would stand against it. The seeing of him is the answer. The seeing of him is the judgment that brings an end to such debate and murmuring. What was the murmurings? I want my place too. I want my place before God. I want to stand before God. Who does he think he is? Remember? It's the whole argument of Korah. We're all holy. We all have a relationship with God. We can all serve God and, and be accepted of God. God is about to make known the one upon whom his eye is fixed. And in that, their murmuring ceases. The word cease there, to make cease, the phrase, it actually means this, to, to cause to sink so that it will never rise again. What do you see when you see the one? To see the flourishing one. I'll say it that way using the, the Young's literal translation. To see the flourishing one. Causes the murmuring of my heart. The murmuring of the natural man. The murmuring of the mind that is... That is motivated by the lust of the flesh. The seeing of the flourishing one causes that to sink as to never rise again. Why? Because the man who is the source of such murmuring is seen to be put away never to rise again. The man who is the source and the foundation and the basis of those murmurings is seen to be put away forever. Never to rise again. You see the only thing that God beholds. You see the only thing that has any validity in the sight of God. You see that everything else has nothing and does not even have a place or have any. God gives no respect to it. He does that with Cain. Why? The, in the Hebrew, it doesn't just mean he didn't give it respect. It means that he, it was as if it didn't exist before him. God is simplifying their relationship and it's this simplicity that must come into the hearts of the church. It must come into our hearts. This simplification of our relationship with God must be revealed. 
I'm going to show you something with regard to that. We'll see Israel here simplified in their sight. What I'm speaking of is God revealing the true identity of the whole. God bringing them to the acknowledgement of the singularity and sureness of his covenant with them. But see, we've said it so many times, we've said it before. This is the thing that is so offensive to the natural man. The simplicity of Christ. The simplicity of our salvation. But I'm telling you, where this simplicity is missing, deception is present. Because I'm still going to believe I have my place and I have my part and we'll spend the rest of our life attempting to prove it. Whether proving it to God or proving it to one another. I deserve that spot. I deserve that place. It's like trying to try out for a football team. I, I did well enough. I deserve to be on that team. It doesn't work that way. There's a singleness and simplicity to this that must be brought into our heart. It is actually showing all things of our standing and our relation to God as being settled and eternally fixed, not in ourselves, but in the one upon whom his gaze is forever settled. Simplicity of Christ is always the objective. Remember Paul says this, there's, there's two places where he uses this word simplicity in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. One is 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12 where he talks about that their conversation among them was in simplicity and sincerity. Now that's not him saying we just use simple words and you know we were real sincere. He's talking about that their manner of living, their teaching, everything they did in the midst of them and in the world, he says, was in a simplicity, which meant they had one thing that occupied their view. They had one object, one single object, because the word simplicity actually means that. It means singleness. It means single. But when I looked this up in Strong's, it also, it was very um, interesting. It meant singleness, but it also meant bountifulness. That's totally contrary to the natural mind. We think bountifulness is found in the abundance of many, right? Actually, the word simplicity here is, is from two words. One meaning is a negative, it's the A, it's the alpha, negative, and then one, a word that means many. So it means not many. We think bountifulness is in many. Whether many people being fruitful unto God. Isn't that what God wants? A bunch of fruitful people? We think that. We think that's what bountifulness is. That's, we think that's what brings a smile to the face of God. A bunch of fruit bearing folk. Is it really? Not according to this picture. Is it... A bunch of spiritual things that we acquire in our journey, in our walk with God. Many spiritual things. Now I have this, I have that. I have love, faith, joy, peace. I have the gifts. I have all of those things. Now, man, there's really a bountifulness in me. Is that really the definition of bountifulness? According to this word, these words are synonymous. Singleness, bountifulness. Why? Because the bountifulness of our salvation, the bountifulness, the abundance, the fullness 
of everything that we have unto God is measured and defined in the singleness of the one who lives in us. There is no contradiction there. But it's contrary to the mind of flesh. One is the bounty. One in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The unsearchable riches of Him. See that? Single, bountiful. And you're about to see that in this picture. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the simplicity of Christ. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, I am fearful that just as Eve was beguiled by the serpent, that you would, your mind would be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. That you would try to find the bounty of reality, of spiritual life, in anything other than the single, singleness and sufficiency of the one who is in you. you would try to get things instead of knowing him as all spiritual things. <coughs> A single and all sufficient one determines the fruitfulness of the whole. <laughs> so, the next day, I'm going to read this um, I think this is starting in verse 8. Let's, let's read verse 6 and 7 in King James here. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece. For each prince one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness, again, in the Holy of Holies. So, now reading this from the Young's Literal. Because there's something in the Young's Literal that's, literal that's very important to point out. The realization that comes into their hearts. Moses bringeth out all the rods from before Jehovah. No, wait a minute, I'm, I didn't read this. And it came to pass, this is verse 8. Came to pass on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and blossomed, blossoms and yielded almonds. Now, there's a couple things. One thing is in nature. The reason it's important, or it's or most of the commentaries will tell you that the reason the almond branch is used. The word in the Hebrew, almond, means awake, awakened, and in nature, the first tree that actually blooms in nature after the winter is the almond tree. To point out something, I think, that he is the first fruit. The firstborn. And again, we've pointed this out many times. He's not the firstborn among many. That would be the picture people would think in this rod of Aaron. He is the one first among many. No, 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 no. It's he is the firstborn in many. See, this, this whole picture has, I've had to re, re-examine what, what it means, what union with Christ means. And what does it mean to be fruitful unto God? What does it mean to bear fruit? Is it even something I do? Or is it a recognition in my heart as something he is? And living in the recognition of the true awakened and fruitful branch. as my life. And growing in that understanding. Is that what it is? 
Now, it blossoms, blossoms. I, I look these words up because I, I, you know, sometimes we look things up just just to look them up. And I found something interesting here. And this doesn't come from me. This comes from the the lexicons. The this is the Strong's, <clears throat> or the um, yeah, I think it's the Strong's um, Enhanced Dictionary I have here on my tablet. And when it uses the word blossom, blossoms. The word blossom means to show self, to show oneself. That's what it means in the, in the Hebrew. It means to show oneself, and the word blossoms is to glisten as a light. Glisten to, to a shining thing, something that shines. So it's saying show oneself and glistening a shiny thing as something like shining. And one of the, they had a per, parenthetical phrase or a little sentence after shining thing. And I thought it was real significant. Bringing this picture back into view. If, you, if you've followed what we've said about the high priest. It says this, glistening as a plate, as a burnished plate is what the strong said. Further down in the definitions it says, a shining thing as the gold plate on the high priest's miter. You see this? It's the same picture that is being seen here. And what I want you to see is that in the blossoming and the blooming, he's showing one who is demonstrating who he is in their midst. He's making himself known as who he is in their midst, the living one, the fruitful branch. We know all of the, the, the scriptures. Isaiah 11, a rod hath come out from the stock of Jesse and a branch from his root is fruitful. And it goes on to say, and that one shall be the ensign of the nations. And his rest shall be glory or glorious. It speaks about the branch in Zechariah. And it tells them to take a silver, take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua the son, the high priest, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch. For he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And it is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne, and there shall be a priest on his throne. It's the priesthood and kingship being brought together in the one man whose name is the branch, the rod. Same word, branch rod. So, so let's, let's go on in this. Running out of time. And Moses bringeth out the rods from before Jehovah and all the sons unto all the sons of Israel. And they look and they take each his rod. Now remember, these rods are not just sticks. They have their names on them. You see? Now, these things have been in the Holy of Holies. God has made His knowing known, His view, His perspective known, and now Moses is making it known in their midst. He's bringing it out. He's revealing God's knowledge in the midst of Israel, and there is a reckoning now that comes into their midst. The reckoning of Heaven itself, the reckoning of truth, comes into their midst. And they take hold. My, there's a, they hold a proof of this reality in their hands. There's something they have to recognize. What is it? First, they have to recognize there is only one rod that is blossoming and bearing fruit. And, and there's another thing we need to point out. That it's not a progressive thing here, is it? He didn't start with a bud and then two or three days later he blossomed and two or three days later he bears fruit. It's all there. The full, the full harvest of the pleasant fruit 
that glorifies the Father is found in this one. And it's there immediately. God is showing there is no progression to Him. There is no progression to His blossoming and fullness. There may be a progression to our comprehension of the fullness of Him, but there's no progression to that fullness. But He shows them this. He comes out and He shows them and they see this one branch bearing fruit, blossoming, as if it lives. It's a, it was a dead branch. Behold, I was dead, now I am alive forevermore. I am the living one. Revelation. It was a dead almond branch. Now it lives. Now it blooms. And they see that one who lives. They see Aaron's name on it. And now they have to confess and bow to that name. To the glory of God the Father. There is a name above Every name made manifestly known. And they hold their dead, lifeless, fruitless branch. And they have to understand in the sight of God, because that's where these were. In the sight of God, only one lives. In the sight of God, only one bears fruit. In the sight of God, there's only one chosen. If we have a life unto God at all, He is it. I don't have a life unto God but Him. I don't bear fruit unto God. He is the fruit that is the pleasure of the Father, that glorifies the Father. If I am to have any part of that, it must be abiding in Him who bears that fruit. You understand the singleness of God's knowledge, the simplifying of their relationship has now come and had its reckoning in their midst. The immensity of this, I, I can't say it very well, I'm not expressing it very well, but just the immensity of this picture. Their names on a stick. And it's just as dead as it was. His name on a living branch. That's what God would do. He would reveal the living, fruitful branch that has awakened, that is the first fruit in us, the first born in many, the single and sufficient one in whom the full bounty of the harvest is found and known of God. Stop trying to bear fruit. Set your sight to know the one who is the fruitful one. The one who is the pleasureful, pleasant fruit that he has awaited and waited for. And now has as his possession and as his eternal Sabbath and rest. But see, the next thing is where I want to go here. I'm out of time, but... The next thing is they they see this. And here's what they say. And this is from the Young's Literal Translation. I say it, it says it better than any other translation I found. And the sons of Israel. Oh, wait a minute. They put back Aaron's rod. One translation says, and the rod returned. They returned the rod back into the Holy of Holies. And that's him standing In the sight of God for us. Hebrews 9.24 Standeth in the presence of God for us. But then they say this. They say unto Moses. We have expired. We have perished. We have all of us perished. Any who is at all drawing near unto the tabernacle of Jehovah dies. Have we not been consumed to expire? 
And you may say, oh, no, no, no. That's not what I mean. Many commentaries miss the point of this. They think God did this to bring fear into their hearts so they'd be scared to never murmur against Him again. No, that's not the point. It wasn't about fear. It was about the reckoning of truth in their midst. They are declaring the truth concerning their state of being. This is not. This is them declaring, we are crucified with Christ we do not live we are dead he alone lives if we are to have any relation to God in the tabernacle at all he is alone our relationship to it he lives unto God and he is made unto us life itself there is no life unto God but him This is not about being dead in sin or crucified in sin. This is what they are comprehending what it means to be crucified with Him. Remember, God is judging in the midst of His people. Not heathen, but the midst of His household. They are experiencing the reality of what it means to be crucified with Christ. They're they're experiencing the judgment of not I, but Christ. Remember, I've said it many times in classes. When you see, yet I live in in Galatians 2.20, I is not there. There is no I in that phrase. Yet I live, no. There's no I there. The only place the I exists is where it says not I. You can look at it in the interlinear Bible. It's true. There's only one who lives here. He is my life. That's what they are experiencing. That's what it means to know even as we are known. You see, they are now knowing even as they are known of God. They are living in the judgment of seeing one living and fruitful branch. And these words in the Hebrew are in the perfect tense, which means it's a, done, it's a done deal. It's something already done. It's not we're going to have to learn to die here. No, it's we're dead. They're seeing something already accomplished. One living and the rest dead. One living and the rest put away. Having no life but Him. And it's not a coincidence (coughs) that after that God begins to speak to the high priest and says to them everything basically this and because I'm out of time I can't get into it because he says he says it in many different ways everything of their offerings of their increase of their approach to me everything of their relating to me at all belongs to you I've given it to you it's your possession it belongs to you in other words everything anything of their relation to God belonged to him who is made unto us all spiritual things so that they who glory would glory in the Lord and in the Lord alone them glory in him this sounds just like Jesus saying all things are given unto me of my father no man knows the father save the son and no man knows the son save the father and then he says come unto me come unto me and I will give rest to your soul see the rest he offered them was not some solace from their works the rest he offered them was himself to be found in him having no fruit nothing of their own only what they were knowing and apprehending him to be by faith and that is the reality God is persistent in driving home in the hearts of those those who are set to know him 
God will simplify our salvation. He will bring it down to the singleness, the simplicity of Christ. And in that one, He will reveal the full bounty of His eternal pleasure. And we will live enjoying and experiencing the unsearchableness, the eternalness of all the riches of Him. That's that's the reality of our salvation. That's what the grace of God has brought into us. And that's what God is pleased to reveal in us. May God simplify our salvation in the revealing of this one fruitful branch. Amen. We'll stop there. Thank you.